I want to welcome all of you to the Southwest Collection Special Collections Library, at least virtually. My name is Bruce Kamak. I'm curator of rare books here at Texas Tech University. And what we will talk about this, this today is the history of the book. And I have artifacts, facsimiles, and books to show you this morning. Uh, and so what we'll be doing is looking at pre-Gutenberg, up to Gutenberg. And we will start with actually Asia, go through that continent, uh, the history of the book, stop, and then start actually in the, the far east, we'll do near east, start with Mesopotamia and go to Egypt and then focus actually uh, much on the, of the presentation on the European experience. Uh, what I have here is, if I, I'll, I'll get started, uh, this is a Chinese oracle uh, tortoise shell, uh, the carpus. Uh, what they were used was for divination. And what took place is that they would take a, 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 a bronze uh, stylus mark uh, text in it in early Chinese characters, plunge a hot uh, uh, metal rod into it, and it would crack. And from the cracks, they would uh, determine whether or not that, that forecast was true, partially true, not true at all. Uh, these date from the late Shang Dynasty, so roughly 1200 BCE. So these artifacts, this is an actual artifact from about 3200 years old. Uh, the characters run vertical, just like modern Chinese does. And I'll show you the back. Uh, these animals, actually the tortoises, were raised just for this purpose. The second is much more modern, but is indicative of, of what took place in, in uh, Asia. Uh, these are various prayers to the Buddha. Uh, this is Tibetan. Uh, this image here as actually has been uh, is in, in uh, illustration. So this is a, a oil-based, I mean, sorry, a, a, a water-based uh, painting, uh, and what appears to be manuscript on the back is actually the same text repeated over and over again, printed. And so these were printed using uh, wood blocks. So these are wood block printing, printing, which is uh, which as you was now this example is probably about 150 years old, but it's ancient uh, and predates uh, Gutenberg's invention of using movable type. These two are called olas. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the substrate is on, on, the, on, the, on the Tibetan book. It's some kind of uh, early paper, early type of paper. Uh, these were done on uh, palm leaves. These are palm leaf books. Uh, the writing goes vertical. Uh, these were actually, uh, if you think of Venetian blinds, this is how they were bound. Uh, a lot of these were used in uh, for uh, prospective uh, couples to look at what a favorable time would be for them to get married. And so they would go through, uh, the person who was operating, they had, I mean, it would be a long string, would go through and find a, a perfect date and place for them to be married. Uh, of course, these are probably 19th century, uh, and this. Uh, of course, is, is this type of, of manuscript is much earlier. This is Japanese. Uh, this is a, uh, the text that came with this was said that this was a uh, manuscript and actually is both printed and a manuscript. So this is once again a printed, not with movable type, but probably with, with I shouldn't say that. I mean, it, it, it might be movable type. Uh, movable type predates uh, Gutenberg um, by 40, 50 years. Uh, but it probably is going to be a, a woodcut once again. And a woodcut is where a, a artisan will, um, an artist will carve out the text or the image. An artisan will, will cut out the wood. 
uh, and what is raised receives the ink, and what is not raised is the white space. And so this has the, the Japanese characters, uh, a Buddhist prayer. Uh, it has a woodcut, a wonderful woodcut. And actually, it's been annotated uh, using a different script, um, also in Chinese, um, so I mean Japanese. Uh, the Japanese are well renowned. This is a, a very late, this is the 19th century um, uh, uh, piece uh, um, text. Uh, for uh, color prints, uh, for woodcut prints. You can see each of the colors depicted here was a separate block, and each one had to be printed, uh, pressed into the paper at a separate time. So you can imagine the logistics and the measurement and, uh, that went into creating something uh, like a beautiful work of art like this. Uh, this concludes the Far East, and so we will stop, and then we will next we will go Near East, up through Egypt and into uh, Europe. Uh, welcome back. Uh, once again, my name is Bruce Kamak, I'm curator of rare books here at Texas Tech University. And what we will talk about now is early writing in Mesopotamia. Uh, writing actually, as far as we understand, and is, is ever involving uh, science uh, occurred when civilizations moved from a hunter-gatherer uh, society into uh, living in small communities and larger communities that gradually grew. We're talking you know, 4,000 uh, BCE or so. Uh, and there was a need for record keeping. Uh, in order to, uh, 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 so the earliest writing were not written down prayers or religious texts or histories or biographies and things like that. They were actually record keeping. And so what took place was you would have these tokens and uh, each one had, uh, which archaeologists are uh, finding uh, in various sites. And each of these tokens represented a different commodity. It could be a bushel of wheat, uh, uh, olive oil, um, actually probably even uh, slaves, uh, human beings. And so what took place was uh, in order to make a contract. And if someone were, were uh, say, I'll give you, I'll, I'll lend you 10 sheep, and then at the period of time, I want my 10 sheep back and, and perhaps some of the, the lamps. And so they would take uh, clay balls, and, the, and they first saw these clay balls, so I thought it was some kind of a game, uh, and they would put the tokens inside uh, representing the commodity that was being exchanged or, or borrowed or, or, or sent. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, uh, uh, and we have the, the, still have the words in, in the English, break a contract. And these would be broken up, broken up, the numbers would be counted, uh, and the transaction would be concluded. Well, somebody figured out, you couldn't tell what was inside, and so they figured out uh, if we impress the uh, tokens on the outside, we could actually read what maybe was on the inside. And then at one point, somebody figured out, why do we need the tokens inside? We have representative writing. And this, in my mind, is the first writing, true writing. Working with the substrate, uh, putting uh, impressions on, on, on clay. And so the early writing, and this is about 5,000 uh, years old. This is actually a facsimile. This is a contract for uh, a, a land sale. Uh, or this picture writing. Uh, and so these are it's very much image driven. Uh, you can see it's, it's, it's actually a clay tablet. Uh, I'm not quite sure if it was original was this color or not. It might have been more close to clay color. Uh, and so uh, this is pre dating uniform. Uh, this actually, uh, there have been uh, research showing how uh, these, this picture writing, uh, slowly over the, over the millennia transformed itself in cuneiform writing. Uh, this is actually something that I have not used before in my presentations. Uh, this is actually a, a, a representation of a nail. Uh, these were placed in temple corners. 
Uh, and they were showing kind of the history of that particular temple, who built it, what gods were, were summoned, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is roughly 3,000 years. This is the real thing. This is 3,000 years old. However, more, uh, and this is, has cuneiform writing, and I'll, I'll explain cuneiform writing uh, right now. Uh, this is, is what a, a normal cuneiform, normal, the most common form of the cuneiform tablet, uh, 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 appear like this is, a, once again, a facsimile. Uh, the tablets were incised in, into a soft clay uh, with a reed uh, written on both sides. Uh, and, and what happened was that there was a, and they were either baked in the, in the, in the sun or for archival copies, copies wanted to keep, they were baked in, in, in fire and in fired, uh, much like a modern brick. Uh, and so there was actually a, uh, a envelope that these were placed in with redundant information on the outside. And so in case the, and these were, were sent, um, just like the mail service now, from one person to another person, uh, or from one uh, ruler to another ruler, or from one businessman to another businessman. Uh, and in case the outside was broken, you've got, once again, as I said, a redundancy of information. Uh, the cuneiform writing is actually, this is uh, supported a lot of different languages. Uh, just like the Roman alphabet supports a lot of different languages, Arcadian, Babylonian, uh, Sumerian, uh, languages like that. Uh, this is actually a facsimile, but a rare survivor. What it is, is a school tablet. And there is, uh, this is probably about, uh, the original was about 3,000 years old. Uh, the teacher wrote out uh, cuneiform uh, in one line, and the student was uh, attempted to uh, reproduce that line. Uh, the best probably was a, a male, uh, a boy who was learning, uh, and then another line for the teacher, and then a line from the you know, for, from the from the student. Uh, literacy was extremely low, as I'll show uh, when we talk about the next segment of my uh, cylinder seals. Um, and cuneiform was not really the best cuneiform uh, platform, was not actually the most easy to learn. Uh, it was both sound and text driven uh, and, so, and symbol driven. And so a, a particular character could have a sound or it could be actually that, that, that text itself. At the same time, we had uh, cuneiform. We also had something called cylinder seals. Uh, and so these are, for the most part, all image driven. Uh, this is the, actually the earliest that we have. Uh, it was, uh, this is not a cylinder. This is actually a, a rectangle of, of stone. This probably is about 4,500 years old. Um, and it predates the invention of, of a, the, at that point, they didn't have the technology to make a cylinder. And so what they were what was that they were impressed into the clay. And we have a, a modern equivalent, which is this silly putty. And lo and behold, if I can release it correctly, an image was, driv uh, was, was created. And here we have probably some kind of god. And actually, it looks almost like Egyptian mot symbols. Uh, with with fire or, or some kind of be, uh, rays coming out, and in the back is actually if you look at this way, is a herdsman with with animals, uh, extremely early, but also it has holes driven through it, and so these were were probably worn as amulets, uh, and, and actually probably status symbols, but eventually the the. The technology uh, advanced to the point where uh, you have a cylinder seal. Uh, so these were cylinders, once again, with the hole still driven in, hard pieces of stone. And if you roll this out onto a back then clay, but here in the silly putty, 
you see in upside down uh, both image and text on this. And, and most of them were actually uh, more image driven and the ones I've selected here have both image and text uh, on them. Uh, and the question is raised, purpose of these. Uh, and what they were were signatures. Uh, they were, you know, why would you have two different systems? Why would you have you know, a cuneiform writing uh, which was perfectly acceptable and, and a workable system? Why would you have an image-driven system side by side? And so many of the actually cultural elite uh, uh, and, the, and the business community could not write or read. And they relied on scri professional scribes to do that. And so in order to sign the documents, and so there are some cuneiform tablets that have on their edge, uh, you can see the impression of cylinder seals in them. And so after the letter or whatever document was, was created by the scribe, uh, the person uh, who was uh, dictating the letter would put his or her symbol on that, uh, more like, like a signet ring uh, of modern practice. Uh, these came, as you see, all different wonderful colors and different, uh, different styles. And this is another, and I'll roll this one out as well. This one actually shows a hunting scene. And not only did we have these, but we also had the traditional seal, which is like this. And I'm probably that's probably difficult to, to, to see. But one thing that, that one of my favorites is actually this one, which looks fairly innocuous from the outside. And actually one of the great things about this, it looks like just a piece of uh, stone, a cylinder, stone cylinder, until you roll it out and hopefully I've got it rolled out the right way. And uh, they'll do a close-up of what it is. This stone has been reused. It originally had text on it as well as image. Uh, that text was actually overlaid with an image uh, at, at one point. Uh, it has cuneiform writing on it, uh, and, and that's been replaced with an image. And so. Uh, you can see these were extremely valuable. They're very expensive to make because the stone was hard to work. Uh, and in this case, they were, uh, it indicates that they were reused over the, over the years. Egypt, ancient Egypt. Uh, as I said before, uh, writing occurred both in China as well as Mesopotamia, but also uh, and there, there might be some influence between Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt, but there's a totally different writing system developed in, in ancient Egypt. Uh, hieroglyphics. Uh, this is a facsimile of what is commonly called the Book of the Dead. Uh, these were, uh, actually the book is, is probably called the Book of Coming Into the Beginning or Into the, into the Light. Uh, it actually is a facsimile that we reproduced on papyrus. Papyrus is a, a, uh, was the substrate that was used for thousands of years. It grew as a reed, a long, tall reed along the Nile. It was harvested. It was cut into sl uh, slices. Uh, these slices were laid on top of the other uh, at 90 degree angles. It was probably buried in the, into the sand and the heat treatment and the drying. And there's an actual, the, uh, the sap within the plant itself uh, provided the, uh, the cement. Uh, and then these were uh, joined together in, 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 these, in, these, in these scrolls. Uh, as I said, this is uh, still referred to the Book of the Dead. Uh, these were buried with uh, with the mummies, with, with the dead. Uh, and I will actually roll this out, uh, and then we'll talk about this particular example of the Book of the Dead. Uh, this is the scroll laid out. Uh, and what they were, like I said, they were buried with, with the dead. And so 
Uh, this, this is actually uh, an Egyptian named Amen. Uh, this is his name uh, in hieroglyphics. Uh, he's holding his hand, uh, his heart. And so the, the construct is actually quite interesting. The, the backstory is quite interesting. Uh, what this means is that uh, Egyptians believed that uh, in the hereafter, there was a physical reincarnation. Not in reincar the, the, the dead actually came to life, bodily came to life. And they could read this, to pick up and made up a scroll and read it. Uh, and unlike our understanding or, or the common understanding is that after you're dead, the body does not come back to life. It's, it's the, the spirit uh, and that's belief structure. And so the idea was that uh, in order to get, there was, the day was divided into 24 hours uh, and there were 24 hours of darkness. Uh, this was seen as part of the passage that the, the soul, oh, the dead person had to go through. Uh, each of those hours had a particular god or a group of gods or demigods uh, guarding it. And so the idea was you had to act as if you were a god yourself in order to pass the 12 hours at night. Uh, and, and get into the into the what the idea of, of the hereafter is, and so uh, Amun is here. And what's interesting about the hieroglyphics, at least in the books of of, of, of is that depending on which way the figure uh, is portrayed, that's how the writing goes. Uh, this picture is person is, is looking uh, to your left. Uh, and the writing goes from right to left. Here's the same text. The, the, the figure is, is, is looking to your right, and the, the text goes from, from left to right. Uh, this goes vertical. This goes horizontal. Uh, actually quite interesting. There's the symbol of the mat. There's the ankh, the uh, 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 scarab, the sacred beetle, the dung beetle. Uh, and so then they go, this is actually the, the, each, uh, each of these were, were, uh, of the Books of the Dead were designed for one person. Uh, these were various gods and demigods uh, uh, protecting that particular hour. And over here were, the, were basically the texts you had to recite in order to get by. Here's Toth, the, the baboon-headed god. Uh, I, I believe that's the baby-headed god. There's a jackal-headed god. Uh, this is bees, the solvable future and past. And also the, the idea was that these were seen as a journey up the River Nile, which is portrayed here by the this, by this sna snake. And so there was various uh, levels of, of symbolism involved. Uh, crocodile, uh, uh, burning uh, uh, coal, uh, who is a, a uh, caterpillar, uh, who is another, is another jackal god. Uh, these are the sacred ores of the river Nile. Uh, uh, this is Hoth, the uh, sacred cow. And so these are the mountains that are to the west. Uh, and so uh, the sun goes down, and there is Ra, the sun god, holding the sun. And there's our good friend Amun, now shorn of his hair in new clothes. Uh, receiving the, the helpful and the, the life-giving rays of the sun. And there's his name again. Uh, and once again, he's looking to your right, and so the text goes from left to right. Uh, one of these things that's interesting is, uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about the codex, these are scrolls. You can see how difficult it is to manipulate, uh, and the reason why scrolls were preferred over the codices is actually the papyrus itself. Uh, in a book format, uh, in a codex, a uh, papyrus, when it's folded over, tends to crack along the, the gutters that go to folds. Uh, and so other substrates like leather uh, does not do that. And of course, paper doesn't do it as, as easily as well. But that's down the line uh, hundreds of years. Uh, and so the next stop we're going to have 
what next will be the meaningful book. Uh, one thing I failed to do is I want to uh, invite all of you to physically come to the Southwest Collections, Special Collections Library Reading Room. Uh, this material is available for your use, uh, for your enjoyment, for your research. Uh, I'm merely the curator, a temporary custodian of the material. This material actually own, is, is belongs to all of us uh, jointly. Thank you. So at this point, we're going to talk about the experience in Europe. Uh, starting with the Roman period, briefly, and go in through the Middle Ages. Uh, this is a facsimile of a Roman wax tablet. Uh, what they were were um, pieces of wood that were hollowed, that were had a, a, a insertion. Uh, wax uh, was placed in it. Uh, working with the stylus, you were able to write uh, text, take notes, write a letter, uh, things like that. Then they were sealed, and actually they were sent uh, over the mail system. Uh, this is kind of a, and then these could be uh, heated, and then with the other side, if you have any mistake, you could actually write it out. Uh, I've been experimenting with beeswax. Beeswax is a lot harder than I thought, and so they probably mixed it up with some other kind of chemical in order to make it slightly softer and easier to use. Uh, and that recipe has unfortunately been lost. A lot of times we find, it's a rare occurrence to find wax tablets with the wax in it still. Uh, there are uh, a few, most of the time we find just the wood and the wax unfortunately has over the years has decayed and, and fallen out. Uh, and so uh, early codex form, and so with the struggles that I showed you, that struggles with the, with the, the scroll of the Book of the Dead, uh, these were much more easy, uh, much easier and convenient way to, to uh, contain information. Uh, but it's, uh, wax was easy, was, was the cheapest way. But also what they used was vellum, and I will This is a, actually a, a lamb. Uh, the original color was not red. This has been dyed red, showing you the, the actually help you see the veins of, of the, uh, the veins in the, in, the, in the skin. And so what it is, what vellum is, uh, modern, if you ask, go to Tandy or someplace that says for vellum, they'll look at you strangely and ask for rawhide. Rawhide is vellum, is parchment. Uh, there are some scholars that indicate there's a difference, but basically, in my mind, a vellum is, is actually uh, a fine quality parchment, but that's just the way I look at it. And so what happens is that the animal is killed, the skin is removed, uh, the, the hide, uh, the skin, the uh, hair is removed, the flesh is removed from the flesh side, it's stretched out, it's actually put in, in uh, alum is used in order to help soften the leather, is stretched and dried, scraped again, and then uh, used in, in, uh, in, in this case for books. Uh, the, the book format was the, uh, the right size, was cut out, uh, then it was processed, and we'll talk about that uh, later when we look at some medieval manuscripts, some, some leaves about the, the, how the, uh, it was formatted and things like that. Uh, and so one other thing I want to talk about is facsimiles and their place in a uh, rare book depository. Uh, facsimiles are a wonderful way of getting a lot of very high value books that are accessible to, uh, to everyone. Uh, the originals, of course, are, are, are quite scarce. Actually, it's a, you know, for not only scarce, but they're unique copies. Uh, and so sometimes you will not be able to handle these, but the facsimiles are a very good substitute. And there are facsimiles, and there are facsimiles. And I'll show you different varieties of facsimiles. Some are true, as true to life as possible, and they are actually, some of them, fairly expensive. And some of them are less so, and they have some color images, which is the most expensive part of the, of, of the, uh, the facsimile uh, for the most part. 
uh, and some of the interspersed text with, with image in, in black and white image. Uh, and also, you keep in mind what is not only with facsimiles, uh, facsimiles, like I said, are usually the high dollar, beautiful uh, books, but also uh, this is what has been kept down through the years. These uh, basically, in, in the way I describe it, is like the Yosemites and the, Ye and the uh, Yellowstones, these beautiful places which are not are preserved for all of us, that, that was preserved, and then the, the prairie, the grassland that was ubiquitous uh, 150 years ago is plowed under and lost. And so what we've lost are all the ephemeral material, uh, the books that were, uh, that were copy books, the laundry list of, of the Middle Ages, as it were. Uh, and so where we're kept are these high end. And so our perception is that all medieval manuscripts look like this, and that's not the case. And I'll have an example later on to show you what a, a medieval manuscript, for the most part, looked like. But going back, this is a a book from a facsimile of a book, and this is one of the, the high quality facsimiles from 780. Uh, this is the the, the Gospels. Uh, and it starts out with images of the Gospel makers. Uh, what sets this book apart from a lot of other books? Uh, and the reason why it was probably treasures is, is actually a, a treasure is the fact that the vellum has not only been dyed purple, and purple was the one of the most expensive colors besides blue. Uh, blue was also from, uh, from Azurite, which only could be obtained from um, Afghanistan. The purple, the royal purple, was, was from a uh, particular mollusk. Uh, uh, of the dye, and so not only was it very expensive to dye the vellum this color, but the text itself is in gold um, uh, ink. Uh, so you can see the decoration, uh, a high end, a beautiful book, uh, page after page of you know, with limited illustrations, but still, uh, this would have been um, something of of quite, uh, uh, is actually a quite significant book. Uh, this is our, our copy of the Book of Kells, uh, probably a much more famous book than uh, the Goleski uh, uh, Evangelium. Uh, what this starts out, these are the, the Book of Kells, is the, the, uh, the four Gospels. Uh, and so, larger format than the first. It starts with, with these tables showing the different, um, it's, kind of, it's not only kind of what it is, is the tables of the books of the Bible, of the, of the four Gospels, showing where they coincide and so where one could be read from. Uh, the same text was in a variety of uh, different books. You can see how this page is actually in, in beautiful color and then the next page is not. And so, they, like I said, there's facsimiles and there are other facsimiles. Uh, this is, is, once again, a beautiful book. Uh, here's Mary uh, and the infant Jesus uh, in this wonderful page of, of, of in, in twine, with entwined uh, animals and, and uh, lines and, and, and other uh, artistic uh, uh, similar artistic uh, depictions. One thing when you look at these books and when you have text and image together, look how the text and the image interrelate inter to each other. Uh, this is actually text. It looks like it's, it's just pure uh, image, but this is the beginning of the book of uh, Matthew. And once again, you get these pages without that were just as beautiful as the others, uh, but they haven't been uh, reproduced in color. Uh, and I'll show you one more image uh, of the Book of Kells. 
here are the four gospel make, uh, makers. And I should probably try to find a carpet page. Uh, and here is the uh, uh, Mark uh, and the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. This next book is something of an oddity. Uh, this is Byzantine. This is 12th century. The first two were in Latin. Uh, this is actually in, in, in Greek. Uh, this is the, the New Old Testament book of, of Joshua uh, in scroll format. Uh, scrolls still existed at this point. Uh, and so uh, the reason we acquired this for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, because it was, it, it was in Greek and not in Latin and something we didn't have. Also, this very much goes... Um, is part of the the uh, process. I mean, what a this is the same lineage of a Roman book. Uh, what a Roman scroll look like, and so you see right off what you can do with this. You can't do a book. You can do a, a page, a long page like this. Uh, what you can't do is is have an index, uh, things like that. And so it's limiting factor as far as the scroll, and that's why the codice eventually won out. Uh, research has been done on this by a Texas Tech student uh, with the indication that this might have been a, uh, a drawings for a column, uh, which is why it was uh, in scroll format, because a column, of course, would be one continuous uh, image. Uh, and it actually had other images on the back on the original, which uh, unfortunately this, this uh, scroll this fact statement does not reproduce. So this is Byzantine, roughly 1120. Uh, this is actually one, uh, 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 one of my favorite books. This is Libra Floridas, the Book of Flowers. Uh, this is an early psychopedia. Uh, this is roughly 1200. Uh, what took place was there was a there was a fear that the world was coming to an end. That's been people have been thinking that for for centuries, for for millennia. Uh, and so a individual decided to write down all the knowledge that he knew at that point in order to preserve it uh, after the end of the world. And so here is the author uh, himself who did all the text, and if I understand correctly, all the image. Uh, and here is God the Father, or, or Jesus, I'm not quite sure. Beautiful illustrations. But like a, once again, most of it is, is text-driven and doesn't have the, and even the images are in black and white. Uh, but one of the most spectacular images in this book is this very complex map of the world with showing uh, the, 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 the center of it, which I, I think is probably uh, the, the uh, eclipse of the, of the sun, the ellipse of the sun. Uh, there's Europe, uh, there's Asia, there's Africa. Uh, and interestingly enough, a lot of these early maps had Jerusalem in the middle of the map. Uh, this does not. So uh, once again, a f showing also that only was the religious books, but there are also books uh, that were of, of uh, more histories. Uh, here's the, the, the lineage of, of a variety of, of rulers. Let's see if we can find another color image. Uh, it appears to be Jesus or God the Father, uh, a, a dragon. We'll see that dragon later on. Uh, uh, probably the the open gaping uh, dragon of, of uh, hell. Uh, actually, we'll see it. This is no, we'll see it a little bit later. Uh, this is the Crusader Bible, uh, and once again, take a look at these images. The images are beautiful. But look at the text. See how the image dwarfs the text? 
Uh, so very much image driven. And so what this tells about the society, not only do the images predominate, uh, it's perhaps that this was, was, could be used as a teaching tool, not only as a beautiful book, but also an idea that you know, uh, in a society that was, uh, had a extremely high, uh, extremely low literacy rate, that these images, uh, which is from the, taken from the Old and New Testament, could be used uh, in order to teach individuals uh, about, the, uh, about the Bible. Uh, this is a well-traveled book. Um, this was actually given to a ruler in, um, in Persia. Uh, and the person was interested in, enough in the text to have it translated into Arabic. And not only that, which you can see on the side, there are some incidents of Hebrew uh, translations into Hebrew. And so this is kind of a very much a cosmopolitan book showing how cosmopolitan actually the world was even back then. And there's the Arabic. And I don't see any Hebrew on this page, but there's the Arabic. Continue with Europe. Uh, this is a, uh, a book uh, only on uh, actually a facsimile of a manuscript on falconry, on how to hunt using birds of prey. So you can see there's, there's the images. Now we can see there's the images of game birds. And also here, this has been drawn in and hasn't been colored. Uh, double columns, uh, uh, images of the birds in the corner, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the margins. Uh, images on the back and the bottom, but throughout the book are uh, extremely static. Uh, the images are always on the bottom and flanking the text. The text is always in two columns. Uh, but uh, look how large this book is. And you can, as I described before, uh, animals had to be killed in order to make it. And so the, the, the vellum and actually, the early paper was the most expensive part of a book up to about 1820, 1830, when it was invented how to make paper using wood fiber. Uh, and so, once again, a very expensive book uh, showing, in this case, uh, not only hunting with uh, birds of prey, but also with uh, uh, dogs, hunting dogs, and uh, kind of interesting with all the uh, surrounded by the buzzards waiting for their turn to, to feast. Uh, and it goes on and on. So very much, uh, in my mind, text-driven rather than image-driven. Um, unlike the next book, uh, this is the Oxford uh, builder, uh, Bi Bible Builder uh, picture book. And so these are like the biggest, the, the greatest hits of the Bible. There's Noah. Uh, let's start out with, of course, with, I'm not quite sure what story that is, because uh, we didn't start from the very beginning. Uh, there's actually, as I indicated before, we would see that monster. Uh, this is the gaping uh, hell hound of, or the beast of, of hell. Uh, and so individuals are going up to heaven, and some are going down into the gaping uh, mouth of, of the mall of, of hell. Uh, then Jesus, uh, or, or God, or, or by the world. Uh, this is 13th century, so very much showing that people knew back then that the world was round. Uh, but absolutely, the text, this is very, this is the expulsion from from Eve, I mean, from Eden. Uh, that's probably, uh, I'm not quite sure what image that is, but, but a very image-driven book. Uh, like I said, you can see how this would have been used in order to teach individuals about the various uh, stories of, of the Bible. Uh, this little book is actually quite interesting as well. Uh, this is what they call a book of hours. Uh, 
Book of Hours were the medieval bestsellers. What they were were uh, books that were published, or uh, I mean not published, were created for the laity, especially for women, in order to follow the canonical hours throughout the day that the, the monks and, and the nuns were following, the prayers that were set during the day. Uh, And so all of them have the beginning of a, of a calendar, which this one does. This is actually quite charming with these line drawings and also the illustrations. Uh, this, I believe, is in, this is in Latin. Uh, they were also in the vernaculars, depending on who wanted it. And also they're localized. If you had a, a saint that was important to your family, or saint that was important to your community or, or to your nation state. Uh, it, was, it was included, but it was always prayers to the Virgin Mary and prayers uh, on, on, on uh, the uh, requiem for the, for the dead uh, and the books. This is uh, Biblia Paparum. Uh, the Poor Man's Bible, uh, this is actually one of my favorite books. What it is uh, are the, the, the New Testament text or image in the center rondelle. And on the outside are uh, examples from the Old Testament, uh, kind of a, a learning. To, uh, so basically, the Old Testament stories are informing the New Testament stories. Uh, and actually, the text is in both Latin and, and in some cases, in, in German as well. Uh, once again, a large book. It was a very expensive book. Uh, so these are fairly static with, with the images uh, on the center, the text on the top, on, on, and flanking the text. Uh, the reason I like this book is, is not so much this, which is actually quite quite nice as it is, what happens afterwards. It's actually two manuscripts in one. Uh, here is uh, the uh, return of, 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 of Jesus and God. Uh, and so individuals are rising uh, from the bodily, from the, from the graves. Some are going to heaven and some are going into, once again, the gaping mouths of, of hell. Uh, we'll see a, a even nicer, nicer, but more graphic version of that. Uh, so this is the uh, the uh, one of the event of eagle. So that's going to be John writing, of course, Revelation. And so this is the book on the Revelation. Uh, here's the actually all the four gospel writers depicted in symbols. And so. It goes on, you get the four horsemen of the apocalypse. There you go. You get angels. You get wonderful beasts uh, uh, with, with tails and stars. And, and, and uh, you know, somebody had a, a, a very vivid imagination. There's Michael, uh, St. Michael killing the dragon. Uh, we will drop that. And once again, you get uh, the gaping jaws of hell, and this individual is being uh, is being pushed into uh, into hell by an angel who's fighting. Actually, this was a, a fighting the devil. And then the last image on this. Is, is the crucifixion with the, the, the chalice and the blood of, of Christ going into the chalice uh, and Mary and, and I'm not quite sure who that could be John. It says David on it, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. So this other book is called the the next one's called the Luther Psalter. Uh, this is English. Uh, that that. The book before was German. Uh, this was commissioned by one family, an English family. Um, I believe it's, it's, it's 15th century. Uh, what actually sets this apart 
or not only see how large the text is, this is, this is the Gospels, um, uh, or the images, um, um, there's the dragon, wonderful dragonfly, but the, some of these images are, to our mind, fairly weird. There's a monkey riding, a, appears to be a goat. Uh, there's all these, uh, actually, if you want to have an idea for a tattoo, this is the book for you uh, to come and, and take a look. There are just page after page of these really uh, remarkable illustrations, which, and keep it in mind, they had symbolism and were knowable back in the day, and we've lost that. And actually, the commentary in this book is very excellent in, in bringing that to mind. So what looks to us to be grotesque, weird creatures to them made perfect sense. Otherwise, why would you take your Gospels, the sacred book, and have weird, it looks like irreligious uh, images in it? Uh, there's, a, there's a conflict in our mind that wasn't in their minds. And so another, uh, I, another wonderful thing about this book is later on, it goes on and on, is that on the bottom pages, this is oh, some of the animals and the wonderful strange animals, strange to us, are depictions of life in um, late Middle Ages. Uh, with with the sheep in in the pen, uh, and so it was actually uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a weird fish like creature. So uh, I will encourage you all to come and and look at this book some more. Uh, and so early on in my lecture, in my presentation, I talked about what a medieval book actually looked like, um, and and so. A case in point, and since this is a classic class, this is something that's extremely appropriate. This is actually uh, a facsimile of a manuscript of Horus. And so the, uh, the, the text of the Hor uh, Horus is on the center, and commentary is on the outside, sometimes commentary on the top. Uh, Manuscript is a mess. It looks like a mess because this is what medieval manuscripts look like. They weren't the high dollar. They were kind of put together as cheaply as possible. And so if, if this were, uh, if I were the professor and you were my class, this might be our class for uh, our text for the semester. And so you would have to make a copy of this. Either buy a copy already made make your own copy or find somebody else if you had enough money to make the copy for you. And so you can see how making copies introduced errors into the text. And so that was a particular concern, especially for the university, not only for, especially for the scholarly community. And so the universities actually had exemplars. They had texts that they would loan you or let you borrow. Um, uh, in order for you to copy from the exemplar rather than from one of your, from your fellow students' texts. Or actually, I would, the professor might have loaned out uh, his text as well. Uh, and so you can see how uh, messy this is, but still has some illumination, some, some illustration on it. Uh, this is supposed to be 13th century. I think it's much later. I think it's probably going to be as late as the 15th century. We have a number of medieval manuscript leaves in the collection. Uh, uh, usually, I mean, always, we, this came in as far as another collection uh, decades ago. Uh, removing leaves from manuscripts is, is seen as something uh, that's not uh, particularly desirable. Uh, but these are actually, uh, so we have them, so we use them as, as actually teaching, material, teaching tools. Uh, this is a, uh, a leaf from a, uh, a Bible. Uh, this is from the book of Job in the Old Testament. You can see the, the Bible is, 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 is a manuscript. And, and so uh, 12th, uh, 13th century, double columns. Uh, and so we talked about 
uh, vellum being very expensive. And the reason why this is so small is probably was a personal Bible. Uh, and so uh, the, 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 how this was created, it was ruled uh, by, probably by one person, maybe by this person doing the text. Uh, uh, and then the text was written and then the uh, illustrations were put in later. So you can see within the context of, of, the, of the text, there are places, spaces for the, the initials uh, and we'll see that even more in the next manuscript. But you can imagine uh, trying to read this, let alone write this with uh, a quill pen. Uh, this is a, probably a breviary page, uh, a larger text, uh, but you can see uh, incorporated into the text are these initials. And this actually has some illumination, some decoration throughout. But once again, uh, you have to keep in mind it's been removed from a larger book. Uh, and so where we see it is in isolation. Uh, it's a precious item, but still, it's still in isolation. Uh, once again, these two are, are in Latin. Uh, not only was Latin used, uh, but also uh, this is a 13th century uh, will. Uh, and so it is in a vernacular of French. Uh, and so this would probably have had a wax seal at one point denoting as, as a official document. And that wax seal has been lost. The vernaculars were used side by side uh, uh, because most people did not know Latin and they, but they could at least understand the vernaculars. Uh, this is a, uh, actually that's a deed, this is a, uh, I'd say that's a will, this is a deed. It probably, it obviously had a wax seal. Uh, this, all these are on vellum. Uh, paper was available, but in short supply throughout Europe. Uh, this is a, a vernacular of English actually in this, in this text. Uh, and so once again, official documents by and large, uh, especially stuff like this, uh, were in the vernaculars and the religious texts were in, in, in Latin. Uh, this is actually something that's one of our treasures. Uh, it's, a, it's a binding, 1625, so the binding has been, been dated and signed. Uh, it is East uh, Dutch uh, for some of the Netherlands, Eastern part of the Netherlands. And what it is, is uh, image, I mean, uh, Different manuscripts have, uh, have actually lost there, or, or the images, uh, the illuminations are from a variety of different manuscripts that were pasted onto this, onto this text, and the text was written around these images. Uh, so this is what a book, actually you can see that you know, there's destruction of manuscripts involved in this text. But also, this is what a one of these leaves would have looked like uh, in situ in, in in real life. Even though this is, of course, the 1625, much later, uh, as we're about to hit Gutenberg, Gutenberg is mid 1450s, uh, 1450, 1455, that time period. And so, this was, was probably a, a special prayer book for a wedding, perhaps a wedding gift. That's why it's dated and has initials on it. But at this point, nobody really knows. On to Gutenberg. Uh, this is uh, a copy, this is not a copy, this is a uh, page from the Gutenberg Bible of roughly 1453 to 1455 when it was created. Uh, as you remember, the, the small little Bible, double columns, only the, what is seen in the black is is printed with movable type. The rest has been done in manuscripts, and so the book was actually created in order to have the decoration uh, in place and have the what we call the rubrication, the red and blue initials, and also the illumination with the with the uh, with the uh, 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 initials. Uh, books at this point, up to about 1800, every book was different. Uh, especially this period, they were all hand decorated. 
or or not depending on how the original owner or when the subsequent owners wanted their books and we'll see this later on with with some of the early printed books whether or not they were decorated or, or, or not some were some were not uh, and so when I purchased this um, uh, uh, 15 20 years ago it's been that long uh, what I decided to do in order to augment this, this tells part of the story. You can see how uh, Gutenberg created his book. Uh, and what I also acquired at, uh, a little bit later is this mid-15th century manuscript. Uh, once again, double columns, but this is actually a manuscript. And you can see the similarities are, are quite striking, not only the format, uh, double columns with the indentations for the illuminations and for the capitals, but also down to the text aside, aside. And so this is an exemplar. This is kind of where, not kind of where, this is how Gutenberg created his Bible. When I first started teaching this, my understanding was that he was copying this page, but that's not it. What it was, was that this is how you did a Bible with double columns and the illuminations and the, and the decoration. And so, uh, and I usually don't talk about cost, but this is, a, this is like a $500 object, uh, $500 manuscript, always probably will be, probably a little bit more now, uh, but not frightfully expensive. Uh, this is tens of thousands of dollars because this is important. This is the end of, in my mind, the medieval period, the beginning of the modern period. And we'll discuss this later on in the next lecture series on the printed text. Thank you.